So now what happens? Everything that we do it stays on this computer. Yeah, and then uh, ask. Uh, then we, you can upload it to YouTube or give okay, it to uh, Avi. Very good. Okay, so first of all, good evening, everyone. And uh, why are we making uh, a Fabrengen? And we don't really need a reason other than it's good to Fabreng with one another. But actually, today is tonight. Actually, begins Rosh Chodesh, and Rosh Chodesh means the beginning of a new month. Now, those of you um, that are familiar. Uh, are, are know the following that in in the Jewish month we sometimes have twenty sometimes we have thirty days and sometimes only twenty nine days. Now, what does that mean? So, without going into all of the mathematics and it's complex, and I it's certainly not my forte. When uh, to we, when you follow the lunar cycle, it's not it's not complicated. Go outside and look at the look at the moon. You know, mark the place from where you're watching it, and then you will see um, from where you are standing from day to day. You will see either the the moon grow. Obviously, it's not growing, but we will see more of the moon, less of the moon, until finally we do not see the moon. And then a day later, we will see the crescent. That moment is called Rosh Chodesh, the head of the month. In days of old, it, we waited for two witnesses to come to the court of law and to say that they saw uh, the appearance of the moon. The Bedin were all very knowledgeable about these laws. And they, if mathematically, it was possible they would quiz if mathematically it could not be so then they would trip them up so if you looking and observing the month you would notice that it's 29 and one half days it's 29 days 12 hours and like 40 minutes between the appearance of the moon for for one month and then the appearance of the moon on the following month so Theoretically speaking, the new moon, I should say again, the new moon, the moon that is seen, which begins a, 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 a brand new month, should begin in the middle of a day. Because every 29 days, 12 hours and 44 minutes, that is when the, the moon will appear. However, we have halacha based on the Chumash itself, that tells us we, we cannot start a month in the middle of a day. It's either the month of Nisan or the month of Iyar. So essentially, either what we have to do is start the Rosh Chodesh 12 hours earlier, because, right, it's 29 days and 12 hours. So we'll have to start the night as, as if the moon had appeared, even though it would not yet appear for another six and a half hours. Or what we have to do is postpone it and push it, even though technically the moon could be seen in the late afternoon or early morning, we are going to start the new month at night. So. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that one half and one half equals a whole. 12 hours and 12 hours is 24. So by and large, 10 of the 12 months are going to be divided into either one day Rosh Chodesh. So it'll be the 29th day of the month. And then the, the, what would have been the 30th day is actually the first day of the new month. Though, if you actually were observing the, the moon to appear, it would not appear until later. So that's when a month has 29 days, the 30th being the first of the new. Or it could be that what we would do is uh, start the Rosh Chodesh a day later. So then we would have Rosh Chodesh on, that w technically would start on the 30th day in the middle of the day, and it would continue throughout the beginning of the first day. 
So we either have one day Rosh Chodesh, two day Rosh Chodesh. This month is the month of ER, and in the Jewish calendar, we always have two days Rosh Chodesh. So tomorrow, we'll, it's, we call it Rosh Chodesh, which again, Rosh Chodesh means the head of a month, but it's actually the 30th day of Nisan. And then Thursday night and Friday will be the second day of Rosh Chodesh, which will be the first day of Iyar. So both of them are called Rosh Chodesh, and both of them are celebrated as a new beginning. But because it's a two-day Rosh Chodesh, the first day of Rosh Chodesh essentially completes the month of Nisan. The second day of Rosh Chodesh begins the month of Iyar. Now, why is this so exciting? <laughs> it's exciting because the, the month of Nisan, which tonight will begin the 30th day or the conclusion, the month of Nisan is called the month of redemption. And the name itself of Nisan means the miracles. In fact, in the Talmud Brachot, there's like five full pages of dream interpretation. What happens if you dream about an animal, if you dream about uh, some type of a tree, if you dream about an activity? And it also has, if you dream about names, N-A-M-E-S, if you dream about names. And the Gemara says an interesting thing. If you dream about a name that has the letter Nun, Nun is a Hebrew letter, but with the letter Nun begins the, the word Nes, miracle. So if you dreamt about uh, the Hebrew name, let's say Natan, not should say Nat, or Nachman or something like that, it would be a good sign because you saw the Nun. Now, I don't know if this applies if it's a Goyesha name, like Nancy, I, I really don't know. But in Hebrew, if you, if says the Gemara, what happens if you dream about a name that has more than one Nun? Like for example, Hananya. It's ches ne, nun nun. So the Gemara then says, Nisei nisem nasoloi. Miracles of miracles will happen. So the second nun not only uh, strengthens the first nun, but it's miracles and more miracles, or miracles within miracles. In Hebrew, we say the, the word miracle is nes. That's nun and asamach, that's one nun. But the Hebrew uh, month that we, we are finishing is Nisan. It begins with a nun and it ends with a nun. That means that the month of Nisan is the month of not only Chodesh HaGeula, the month of redemption, but it's the month of miracles of miracles. In fact, I, I, I don't know how many could picture the Hebrew letters in their mind. But the, there's, we know the, there are certain letters when it's at the end of a word, the letter is extended downwards, like past the line. So in the word Nisan, it begins with the letter Nun, which is on the line. But the, le, the last letter called the final Nun extends downwards, to which the mystics explain that when you have a letter, that begins from above the line and it extends downwards, that's a sign of hamshacha, of drawing it down, making it more real. So in the month of Nisan, which today is the 30th day, tonight we'll start the 30th day of Nisan, but it's also Rosh Chodesh, the beginning, it's still part of the beginning of the new, the new month, <coughs> the new month. So, Nisan, as the last day, has not only miracles, but miracles of miracles, which either are happening or still waiting to be, or waiting to be revealed. Contrary to, in, in the spiritual world, one of the things that we know about the spiritual dynamics is that very often, it's the direct opposite of the physical dynamic. 
So for example, if I told you that on earth in the physical world, the, the, the foundation of something is on the bottom of the building. If I told you in a spiritual sense, I would say if there's a foundation of something, that would be on the top. In other words, everything would flow from this truth. In the physical world, when we're at the end of something, it's usually the weakest. I mean, just look at us when it comes Friday. We're exhausted from a whole week. Or look at us at the end of a day. Or look at us at the end of a project. Or look at us at the end of, of something, at the end of sports. We're usually tired. But in Judaism and in mysticism, very often the end becomes the most powerful. It's as if to say all of the momentum which was generated when it comes to an end, it all gets compounded and redoubled. In fact, there's an expression that if you throw, for example, a ball against the wall, the actual hitting of the wall and the rebound is, has more strength or more energy than, than the energy that was conveyed by the, by, the, by the ball moving through the air. It's when it comes back that it actually gets a stronger. Or well, this, what I'm gonna tell you is, uh, you could easily ascertain for yourself. You know, when you walk outside in the sunlight, it could be bright, but if you see the sunlight reflected off cars, or off, off, off the snow, it becomes blinding. Same sunlight, but it's almost that the reflection, the rebound has more strength than the, the, than the straight one. So the same idea is, when we started the month of Nisan some 29 days ago, it was with a lot of excitement. We have 12 days of the, and then there's gonna be Pesach, and. It was great. And then we're going to have the Seder and, a little, and we're going to get out of Gullus. And here we are. The month is co almost completely finished. Only 24 hours left to the month. And it's already not even the 24 hours of this month because it's called Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of something new. And yet we are taught that the end of something often has the most intense part of the whole month. So Going back to why we for bringing, the answer is today begins Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of a two-day uh, a two-day uh, celebration that marks the beginning of a new month, and of this two-day celebration marking a new beginning, the first of these two days is actually the end of a miraculous month, and because in, in spirituality, the end of something is always wedged in the beginning. The end and the beginning become as one. And the end is not the weakest point, but at times the strongest point. So then we're celebrating tonight because we want to see the miracles that we know uh, that are implicit in this month. We would like to see it revealed. And we're already celebrating this, this concept with a Hasidic Shafabring and a Hasidic get together. The second day, uh, I will take a, a, a l'chaim break for a second. L'chaim, l'chaim. Oh, and we awesome. see the miracles. <laughs> and another l'chaim, those that need healing, should may they all be healed. L'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim. Oh, Steve, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. All right. I can hear the clink of the glass, you know. Right. What's, what's special about the second day of Rosh Chodesh? It's the first day of the month of Iyar. Now, it's interesting. There are not that many days that are specified in the Bible of, what, of the events that took place on that day. So, for example, in, in the story of Moses uh, hitting the rock, it doesn't say clearly which day of the month was it. 
But the first day of Iyar is marked very specially because in the book of, of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, it be, actually begins that on the first day of the, of the second month of when the Jewish people left Egypt, in other words, the Jewish people left in the month of Nisan. So a complete 12 months had passed, and the beginning of the 13th month, which is Iyar, one year after they left, a little bit more than a year after they left, God told Moses to count the Jewish people. And that's how the book of Numbers begin. When did this counting begin? On the first day of Iyar, which is, of course, going to be the second day of Rosh Chodesh. Well, what, what, why is that special for us? Because God doesn't have to count the Jews to know how many Jews there are. And yet, he made Moshe count the Jews and make a census. Why? And it took a couple of days. And it certainly took a lot of energy of Moshe and Aaron and the 70 elders. And the answer is to, to remind us of how precious we are in the eyes of God. Because things that are very precious, you not only know the number, but often you count it. So whether it be the person counting his money or a person who's happy, who counts his blessings or a, a, a successful business person who counts, you know, uh, the success, things that are important, you count. No one until recently counted toilet rolls. Now <laughs> it's a big spiel, of course, to, to actually get it. But if it says 500 on a roll, even today, no one counts it. But if you, if, or no one would count 82 tissues in a tissue box. But if you buy eggs and it says a dozen, a lot of people will open up just to make sure that there are 12. The more precious, the more the number counts. So Hashem wanted to remind the Jewish people eternally, and it's recorded in his Torah, that on the first day of Iyar, God told Moshe to count the Jewish people, and in the words of Rashi, Laharos Chibasam, to show and to demonstrate the love that God has for the Jewish people. He wants to make sure that he knows everyone from which tribe, uh, Ruvain, the son of Shimon, and Yankov, the son of Tadris, whatever it might be. It's very important. So essentially, Rosh Chodesh Iyar for us is a reminder of how precious each and every one of us is in the eyes of God. Now you put these two days together, back to back or front to front, the month of miracles and the, and the next day, the day that begins a reminder to all of us that there's no such thing as an unimportant or insignificant Jew. Rather, each one is part of the 603,000 uh, men who left Egypt, and by, by uh, extension, their wives and children, this is really an uplifting thought. But there's actually something else I want to share with you. Uh, and um, in the book of our heritage from Eliyahu Kitov, he reminded me, if you look in the book of Exodus, in the book of Shemos, if you remember the, remember the story, the Jewish people leave on the 15th day of Nisan, right? on the 15th day of Nisan, seven days later, they cross the sea. And what happens after they cross the sea? After they cross the sea, and I'll just give you the reference. You can look it up yourself if you would like. It's in the it's chapter fifteen and verses uh, twenty through um, no verses twenty two through twenty five. Basically, they they come out of the sea and they're looking for water, and they come to a place called Mara, which means bitter. They actually come to a type of a lake. It was like an oasis. There was a lake, but the waters were not drinkable. It was bitter. And they complain to Moshe. They say, Moshe, what are we going to drink? 
How are we going to drink this water is not drinkable. Moshe prays to God, and God says, take a branch of a tree, throw it into the water, and it will sweeten the water. According to many commentaries, he told them to take the branch of a tree, which by nature has a, a bitter aftertaste. So he, he took something bitter to throw it into water, which was bitter, and then miraculously it was sweetened. When does this take place? Well, if, if you count, the, if you do the math, right? 15 plus seven, then plus another three, we come to Rosh Chodesh. It actually happened on Rosh Chodesh year. And because what happens in biblical, in the, in the biblical sense continues to happen, that tells me a message. And that is that Rosh Chodesh year, which is not actually tomorrow, but on, thir on, but on Friday, it will be the first day of year that there's a concept and a, a blessing that's put into it. And that is the capacity to transform bitter into sweet. No, do you need another reason to, isn't that a good enough reason to fabring and to say lachayim? All of us could use sweetening. God is good, but we like it to be sweet. In addition to which, Look at the verse itself when you get home. God tells the Jewish people after he sweetens the water, he says, um, listen to me, be loyal to me. I will not bring any sickness upon you. And now I'll give the quote. Ki ani Hashem rof echa, for I am the Lord, your healer. Or I am the Lord, who, who heals. So all of the great teachers of, of Judaism point out those four words that I, I, if you will do the Torah, you, you will be kept healthy for I am Hashem, the healer. Ani, it starts with an Aleph. One of the ways we write God's name, because we have so much respect for the name of God, we often do not write it in with, with, properly with the letters. Instead, we do two yuds. Yud, yud, and you see that in a, in a prayer book, or you see that in a holy book, you know it's the name of God. So we have an aleph, we have two yuds, which is the name of God, and we have the word rof echa, your healer, which begins with the letter Resh. So what word do we have? Aleph, Yud, Yud, and Resh, which of course is the month of Iyar. So we have a lot to forbring about in a good way. Because on Rosh Chodesh Iyar, God says, I want every Jew to be counted. Every Jew is super important. Every Jew is super holy. Every Jew is super indispensable. I can't have my people unless, unless every one of them shows up and is counted. And it's a day that Hashem promises to take from bitterness and to make it sweet. And it's a day that begins a month of healing that's already three is a charm. Where does that leave us? Well, I got to tell you, it shouldn't leave you anywhere. It should uplift us. It's, it's, it should uplift us, it should encourage us, it should gladden our hearts that from a month of miracles, and we have seen miracles, the fact that you're on right now is a miracle, not only because I'm not technical, but because, thank God, we're healthy enough to be here. That in itself is a miracle. And the fact that we're proud Jews is a miracle. And the fact that we're expecting Mashiach at any moment in spite of, uh, of 1,900 years of delay is a miracle. So with all of this month of miracles, and it ain't over, we got 24 hours for Hashem to take the last day of the month and to make it the strongest day of the month. And then that leads us into a Rosh Chodesh, a beginning of a month where bitter water was transformed into sweet. 
and a, and, and a time where Hashem promises to be the healer, this, my friends, is something that we should um, exalt it. So l'chaim, l'chaim, let's do a nigan, l'chaim. L'chaim. L'chaim l'bracha. I let it um bum 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 you know, the Super Bowl has a number. I don't know what the number is, but I think it's like Super Bowl 5, Super Bowl 100, whatever it is. You know, in, in, in the yeshiva world, the Siam of Shas also has a number. Just recently, a couple of months ago, actually, in the year 2020, uh, what, what, where are we? 2020, they uh, they finished uh, for the 13th time the entire Babylonian Talmud, which is a seven and a half year um, cycle. In other words, to go through one page, both sides, from beginning to end, there's uh, over seven years. And it's uh, remarkable how from year to year it grows. So I wanted, so they just celebrated the 13th. It's interesting. Uh, they had celebrations all over the world. The biggest one was in a stadium in New Jersey. They had 92,000 Jewish people gathered together to celebrate uh, a completion of study. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know, in, in the annals of world history, who gets together on a cold day, on a New Year's Day, to celebrate that we studied and that there was wisdom. And more importantly, much more importantly, there was godly wisdom that was studied. But I want to tell you a story that happened in 1990, which was the ninth Siam. And at that time, they had 20,000 Jews in Madison Square Garden. Just uh, an over just a couple of years, take a look at the, at the jump of number of participants and how much, how much larger the celebration became. So in that Madison Square ninth uh, conclusion, one of the main speakers, or I should say main, one of the major speakers was a very big Torah scholar whose name was Rabbi Meisha Naishlos. And uh, he was the Dayan, he was the rabbinic authority in, in Square Town. As you know, in upstate New York, there are some enclaves, uh, almost like a shtetl, literally. I mean, they have electricity and running water and cars, but essentially the lifestyle and the life that's trying, they're trying to perpetuate is really a very pure, um, basic Jewish life. And one of the places is called, I think it's called Square Town. And they have a Hasidic leader called the Square Rebbe. And obviously when you're in a very, very religious, highly observant and very educated uh, community in the thousands, to be the supreme um, halachic authority, you really got to know your stuff. So this Reb Meisha Naishlos was their, uh, their halachic supreme authority, um, dealing with all kinds of questions as basic as Shabbos and kosher and complicated as life and death issues. And he was very well respected, passed away uh, some years ago. So in this 1990, he was one of the speakers you know, offering a blessing to the people that had, that had uh, completed the Talmud. One of the guests that came was a gentleman whose name was Hirsch Leib Mandel. This is a real guy. I didn't change the name. And uh, he was already, I think, at that time, maybe in his 80s or late 70s. And uh, he was a Hungarian Jew. And of course, was religious, he had a beautiful family and grandchildren, and uh, wanted very much to attend this, uh, this gathering of 20,000 Jews celebrating Torah. For he himself, when he was uh, unmarried, he, he was a full-time yeshiva boy, 
and he was actually one of the select people of his yeshiva, and he became what's called in Yiddish the Heizbucher, which means the young man in the house of the rabbi, he became like his, uh, not assistant, he would take care. But he actually, it was a big honor for a boy to be chosen to be the Heizbucher, because you picked up a lot. You had chances to talk to the rabbi, you saw some of the guests, and it was always interesting in, 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 in these towns of these great rabbis to be there. So now he's in his uh, probably late 70s. He's there and he hears Rabbi Moshe Nishlos uh, speaking. Nishlos speaking. And uh, he picked up right away on the accent. But he couldn't get the name. So he told his son, he said, I know this accent and I want you to do something for me. I'm going to write a little note and I'm going to go, I want you to, to deliver it to him because I want to meet him after this big event. So the son tried to tell the father, you know, he's sitting by the dais, you know, we're sitting amongst the group. But it's not going to be so easy to get to him. There's a lot of dignitaries and there's a lot of security and he's very busy. So the father said, please do that for me. So what happened was um, the son actually went, found an usher who brought him to the dais. He found another usher and gave it to the secretary of this rabbi. When the rabbi read the note, he told the usher to tell the guy to tell the boy that he would be delighted to meet with his father. After uh, the event was over, you know, 20,000 people leaving an arena is uh, quite crowded, so it took some time. And as the dais was uh, being emptied, uh, usher ran over to this Hirschleib Mandel and says, we'll go to a uh, side room until the people leave, you'll have some time with him. When he came into the room and this Reb Meisha Naishlas was there, Hirsch Mendel who says to him, did you once live in this and this town in Hungary? And Reb Meisha says, as a matter of fact, I used to visit often. I didn't live there. I... So he said, do you remember in the early 1940s when you were in prison? And for a moment, he looks at him. He says, it's, it's you, here, Schleib, and they embrace. So now, let me take away from the suspense and tell you what had happened. What had happened was, as, as sadly we know, the Nazis made their memory be, be erased. They were so evil. They started the deportations in Hungary in 1944, or, or late, late in 1944. So relatively speaking, when I say relative, that means relative to Germany, to Austria, to Poland, Hungary was, 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 was not actively doing what, what the Nazis were doing elsewhere. So Hungarian citizens, even if they were Jewish, had a tiny bit of rights, of some, some, some decency that was accorded to them. But there was a tremendous amount of, of uh, anti-Semitism from um, the semi-military, which was later on the Iron Cross. But even in 1940, I, I wrote it down for me for my, so I could pronounce it. They were called the, the Zandar police. And, and they were known to be terribly anti-Semitic. And every Hungarian Jew tried very, very hard, not only not to break the law, but to make sure to keep out of their way. So this here slave um, is um, Friday night. He's in his rabbi's house. And a Jew runs in and says to the rabbi, Rebbe, did you hear? No, what, what was I supposed to hear? They, they arrested a Jew. He's not from our town. I heard they beat him up. And he's, he's right now in the police station, and if we don't do something, he might not make it. The rabbi understood that we're talking about pikuach nefesh, uh, to save a Jewish life, but he also knew that if he was gonna go himself 
to the to the police station, these anti Semites very politely would say, uh, "You cannot see him. It's against the law, and there would be nothing for him to do." So in the rabbi's house, they had a maid. We'll call we'll, we'll call her I don't know Mary for now, and not only did she know Jewish customs, she spoke. Hungarian well, because she was a Hungarian non-Jew. She spoke even Yiddish. And she was very familiar with everything Jewish. She had been a maid in the rabbi's house for way over 15 years. So the rabbi said to this uh, Maria or Mary, whatever her name was, maybe take some kosher food, go to the, to the police station, and act innocently. Say you, you heard that one of your former uh, a boyfriend's is in prison and you want to just check to see if it's true. So she takes the food and what happens is she goes to the police station. She's not Jewish. Uh, was a, you know, was a, was a provincial police station and she comes up with this ridiculous story and they said, sure, walk, walk in. She walks, there was only two or three holding cells, and right away she saw a Jewish guy who was bleeding, and he was really messed up bad, really sadly beaten up. So she went over to him. She didn't have time to do much. She just said, I come from, a, from the Jewish community. What's your name, and how can we help you? And I brought kosher food. He looks at her, she's not Jewish, and he wasn't sure, is she authentic? Or are they trying to further incriminate him by trying to send him a stooge? So he refused the food and he said, go back and tell the people that you met, I, I wrote it down, that you met Uye Lokat. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, but it's Hungarian. Uye Lokat, which literally means a new N E W lock, L O C K. So she looks at him and says, I asked you, what's your name? And he didn't want to say. He didn't want to get anyone in trouble and he didn't want to incriminate himself any further, not knowing who this lady was. All he said was, go back and tell them that you met. Uye Lokat. So she came back to the rabbi's house and she says, yes, there is a Jew there. He is badly beaten. But he, all he told me when I asked him his name was, he told me Uye Lokat. And all the people in, around the table are trying to figure out what does that mean? His name is not New Lok, New Lok, until someone realized in Yiddish, Nu is noi, and lak is shlos. So it's, 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 it, it's noi shlos. And right away they knew he was right. There was a very successful Talmud Chacham. He was a great Torah scholar, but he was a businessman. And he would, on his business trips, he would, his name was Moshe Noi Shlas, And he would always stop by this particular place and be the rabbi's guest, and they spent hours in conversation of Torah, and then he would go to the yeshiva and test the boys. And he, and he wasn't even a practicing rabbi. He was just, he knew everything. As soon as they realized that it was this esteemed Talmud Chacham rabbi, who's also a businessman, the rabbi ran to the mayor of the city, who was Jewish, and told him, you have... No, the mayor, no, no, the head of the Jewish community, and he said, you have to go to the mayor and tell the mayor that he has to intercede. They arrested the wrong guy. We know we take responsibility. He's a man of great integrity. The head of the Jewish community ran to the mayor's house, promised him that the Jews would, would vote for him. And the mayor himself, accompanied by some of the prominent Jews, went to the, uh, to the, police station and had Meisha Neishlos released. Of course, when Meisha Neishlos was released, he went straight to the rabbi's house and Hirsch Leib, who was 17 years old, um, you know, walked with him. When he came to the house, 
Mayor uh, Ramesha says to the boy, uh, the boy here slave, he says, I'm going into a private room and I need you to be there. So the boy thought that the, the man was beaten so badly that he needed someone to help him change his clothing. The rabbi had given him a fresh set of clothing because his had blood on it. And he thought that maybe he needed some help. He said, sure, I'll help you. When they came into the room, Maisha took off his shirt. Then he took off his, his uh, tzitzis. And then he took off his undershirt and Herr Schleib gasped. The front and mostly the back was filled with, with uh, marks of a, uh, of, 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 a, of a strap. And the rabbi says to Hirsch, count how many red marks, how many welts can you count? He didn't understand. You want me to count it? He said, yes, and make sure you don't leave any. So Hirsch was sort of freaked out. He didn't understand why. So Rav Meisha looks at him and he says, I want to let you know, when they started to beat me, I promised God for every hit that I get, I would give 10 penga. That's a type of Hungarian currency. I would give 10 penga to charity. I want to keep my promise. So count. Hirsch realized that he's in the presence of not only a great scholarship, but really almost saintliness. He's being beaten because he's a Jew. And each time he gets a beating, he's promising God that he's going to give kindness and charity to, to people. He counted. It was over 40. When he told that to Reb Meisha, he put on now the new clothing and uh, basically went for the Shabbos meal and after Shabbos left. What happened from 1944 onwards, Hirschleib never heard of him again. But now when, when he heard the voice, he recognized the accent and Reb Meisha hugs him and he says, you know, you saved my life. And of course, here says, I, you know, I was just a kid. It was, it, it was, uh, it was an honor. Anyway, until the end of Heer Schleib's life, they kept in contact. Reb Meisha Neishlos, this great Talmud Chacham, who's the head of Square Town in upstate New York, was in contact with this Heer Schleib, who I believe lived actually in Los Angeles. Why do I tell the story? I tell the story because it's, it's interesting, at the least, it's inspiring. But there's really much more that I, that I personally get from it. And that is how a, a holy person and, a, and a prop, the proper attitude, every single time he was beaten savagely, he turned that into an opportunity to serve God. He, he used it every hit, every hurt, every welt was another opportunity for him to promise God that he would give God something. And you ask yourself, is that a response? Someone smacks you and you say, can I give you a sandwich? Another smack. And can I invite you home? And another smack. And maybe, may, maybe I could buy you a new pair of shoes. That's what it seemed like over here. He's being beaten because he's a Jew. And with each time he's being beaten, he's actually promising God that he wants to give charity corresponding to that. Now, there might be other reasons and much deeper reasons, but that's what I got from the story. And why the reason why I'm mentioning it is because, and I will talk a little bit later as well about this, because we're living in not only unusual times, I cannot speak anything how uh, bad because God has been treating me with, with, with open miracles. But when you just see and hear people struggling for their economic daily existence, and then the, you hear about the people that are sick and people that didn't make it and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of consternation and a lot of pain out there. And it's coming from a disease 
which clearly God knows what's happening. He's the actually, you know, he's the one that that's conveying it. You could take it as a hit in the back. You should take it as an opportunity to respond with a mitzvah, to respond with, with a goodness, to respond, believe it or not, with a smile and joy. As, as the Divrei Chaim, Rab Chaim Sanzer, reminded us many times, he was, he was a great Hasidic leader who suffered uh, plenty in this world. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, it happened when he lost one of his children, died, and uh, he did not lose his equilibrium. So they said, Rebbe, you must be t hurting terribly. How is it possible for you still to remain simcha, to remain optimistic, and, and to have a joyful outlook? Don't you feel the pain? And his response was, if I'm walking down the street and someone slaps me on the back and for a moment I'm startled and a little bit unhappy, it hurts. But then I turn around and I see it's my best friend with a big smile saying, Chaim, it's so good to see you. Then I don't feel the slap anymore because the slap was given not only good-naturedly, it was given by my best friend. If it's my best friend, it was, a, it was an embrace of love, though it did startle me and it, and it did hurt me. But for my friend, I feel the love in that. Said Reb Chaim, whenever I see or experience something negative, it's very painful. And then I say, where, where's it coming from? Who's giving me that slap on the back? I would like a pat, not a slap. But even if it's a slap, and I turn around and I see it's from my loving Father in heaven, who truly cares about me and truly loves me and truly is concerned about me and truly wants my good, then how can I lose hope when I know it's coming from such a holy and a good place? It's not easy dealing with this virus or with this COVID-19 or whatever they want to call it. Not easy at all, even for those that are blessed with all kinds of blessings. And certainly those that are actually experiencing some of the negativity that this brings, certainly it's not easy. But then remind yourself, where's it coming from? There, it's coming from God. God is good. There is a reason. We don't always understand the reason. There is a purpose. We don't always see the purpose. There is a goal. And here we could see the goal. The goal is to bring the world in general and his people in particular and me and you specifically to be reminded that God's presence is desperately needed in this world. And God's presence is desperately needed to be felt by all not only by the few holy ones that see and feel God in their prayers and in their studies, but the guy on the street, the lady on the street, the children playing in the, in the playground, Jew and Lahabdul, non-Jew, everyone. We need God to be with us in a revealed way. We need the Mashiach. So if there's a rabbi who's living in the 1940s in, in, in Hungary, and was not only unjustly, but cruelly mistreated, and yet had the presence of character to say to himself with every hit, I'm going to act, I'm going to act in kindness for their cruelty. Every time they hit me, I'm going to give more tzedakah, which is increasing in goodness and kindness. Another cruelty, another evil, responding with more goodness and more holiness. If he could do it, and the countless and numerous other heroes, men and women throughout history, we certainly could do it. So I started off, it's, it's the last day of, of the month of miracles. It's the first day of a month of healing. It's going to be both miraculous and healing. And in the meantime, let us always remember that the Jewish response for Tzuras 
is to is to change from sora, which means those of you that know Hebrew, sadik reish hey, which means trouble, to tsohar, sadik hey reish, which means light. That's a teaching from the Baal Shem Tov. From tsara, from straits, and from compression and from pressure, you change it over to light, to brightness, and to opportunity. L'chaim. Okay, let's, we need a good niggin. Who wants to start a niggin? Uh, I don't hear. <laughs> Okay, we'll stop with that and then we'll start a little faster. Thank you, that was good. That was a real Hasidish <laughs> nigga. Uh, oh, I see Avi. We'll do Yemen Hashem. Yemen Hashem, Romei Yema, Yemen Hashem, Eisachoyel, Yemen Hashem. Romei Yema, Yemen Hashem, Eisachoyel. Da 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 da